won the hits five seconds of summer with easier we also heard katie perry chained to the rhythm so uh, last time i checked she was still pregnant she hasn't gone into labor yet <laughs> i'm keeping an eye on her i'm nikki strong and this is voa one welcome to learning english a daily 30-minute program from the voice of america i'm pete musto and i'm dorothy gundy this program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear stories from Anna Mateo, Jonathan Evans, and Kelly Jean Kelly. But first, this report from Katie Weaver and Mario Ritter, Jr. Schools and educators across the United States are in the middle of a debate over how best to reopen schools. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released guidelines to assist school systems in reopening safely. The suggestions include face coverings or masks and social distancing rules. Some parents object to both ideas. They want schools to operate just as they did before COVID-19. Others are calling for part-time school and face coverings for everyone. Kim Sherman is a mother of three in the city of Clovis, California. Don't tell me my kid has to wear a mask, she said. Sherman said she is conservative and supports President Donald Trump. Trump, a Republican, has called on schools across the country to fully reopen. He threatened to withhold federal money from school systems that do not return to in-person classes in the fall. He has accused Democrats of wanting to keep schools closed for political, not health, reasons. Some parents have threatened to withdraw their children from school if masks are required. Hillary Salway is a mother of three in Orange County, California. She is part of a group calling for schools to fully open with normal social interaction. If the school system requires masks for her son's kindergarten class, she said, I don't know if my son will be in the public school system this fall. Salway started a petition last month urging the area's school system to keep facial expressions visually available. And she helped organize a protest of more than 100 people outside the school system's headquarters. Other parents have expressed similar opinions in Orange County Board of Education meetings. The five-member elected group supports a full return to school without masks or social distancing. Supporters argue that face coverings are ineffective and give a false sense of security. Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom, however, has ordered Californians to wear masks in public. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says masks may help prevent infected people from spreading the virus to others. It has urged students and teachers to wear them, especially when social distancing is not possible. Brooke Aston Harper, a parent in Orange County, 
attended an especially lively school board meeting recently. She described what she heard from some speakers there as horrifying. She said they were forcing what she called their small worldview on others. I'm not looking for a fight. I just want us to take precautions, said Harper, whose two children are age four and six. She also started a petition. It calls on schools to follow state guidelines that include masks for teachers and students, social distancing rules, and other measures. For each school board, the question is going to be, what does our community want and who is the loudest, she said. Some parents, educators, and doctors argue that there are social, educational, and emotional costs to children who do not go to school. They say those costs may be greater than the risk of the virus itself. The American Academy of Pediatrics has provided guidelines supporting in-person school to avoid social isolation and depression in students. But it said science, not politics, must guide decisions where the coronavirus is spreading. Texas is a current hotspot for COVID-19 infections. Its Republican governor, Greg Abbott, and Texan education leaders say it is safe to open schools in August. Abbott's government has not released COVID-19 safety guidelines for reopening. It has said masks are a decision for local officials. Stacy Pugh is a fifth grade teacher near Houston, Texas. She hopes her school system will order students to wear masks. She said she will wear a mask and a shield, a large piece of clear hard plastic that hangs in front of the face. I'm even considering getting some type of body covering to wear, she added. The Texas American Federation of Teachers has demanded guidelines for reopening. President Seth Capo said, We won't sacrifice our members and students for politics. New York City and Los Angeles, California, operate the two largest school systems in America. Both cities are led by Democratic mayors. Officials in those cities say their schools cannot fully reopen. New York City officials say schools there will likely combine in-person and distance learning. In Los Angeles, school officials announced Monday that students will start the term with online classes from home. Other California cities, including San Diego and Oakland, also say their schools will stay closed. A 10-year-old student might have a 30-year-old teacher a 50-year-old bus driver, or live with a 70-year-old grandmother. All need to be protected, said Los Angeles Schools Chief Austin Butner. He said public health safety demands the schools avoid becoming infection centers. Besides masks, The CDC has advised schools to seat students at a safe distance apart in classrooms and eat meals there instead of in larger shared rooms. 
Some people in small rural communities argue they should not have to follow the same rules as people in big cities where infection rates are higher. Craig Gensler leads the Wheatland School District, a system of four schools in California's Yuba County. He said that Wheatland already has spent $25,000 on physical barriers for classrooms. 85% of parents who answered a Wheatland opinion study said they want their children in school full time. Officials will space out desks as much as possible, but they still expect up to 28 students in each classroom, Gensler said. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Flowers add so much to our world. They feed the bees and other pollinators. They are beautiful. Some smell so good that they are used in perfume, lotion, and other body products. Many parents name their daughters after flowers. Popular ones are daisy, rose, lily, jasmine, heather, holly, and violet. On today's program, we are going to talk about that last one, violet. The name violet is found in an English expression. A shrinking violet describes someone who is very shy. Oh, my shrinking violet, I left my basket of impatience at your door. I brought my tulips for your tulips, but the bulb don't burn anymore. Shrinking violets are not bold. They are afraid to speak their minds. When faced with a difficult situation, a shrinking violet seems to get smaller. They shrink away from the problem. Another adjective to describe a shrinking violet is modest. They do not like to be the center of attention. However, we often use this expression to describe people who are the opposite of modest, shy, and fearful. And we often say it in a special way. We say that someone is no shrinking violet instead of saying not a shrinking violet. Let me give you an example. My friend Olga loves to perform. She is a great singer. And she's no shrinking violet. If there is a party, you don't need to ask her twice to sing for a crowd. Just give her a microphone and an audience, and she is ready to perform. Now that I think of it, she doesn't even need a microphone or an audience. She's also no shrinking violet when it comes to sharing her thoughts. You always know where you stand with Olga. To know where you stand with someone means you know how they feel about things and how they feel about you. They share their thoughts and feelings freely. Now let's talk about another flower, the wallflower. If you look up wallflower in the dictionary, you might get confused. Miriam Webster's online dictionary says, wallflowers are hardy herbs often grown for their showy, sweet-smelling flowers. They are even able to grow in extremely small cracks in walls. That is where they get their name, wallflower. In nature, wallflowers may be showy or have a very noticeable appearance, but strangely, people who are described as wallflowers are not showy. 
In fact, a person who is a wallflower is the opposite. Like shrinking violets, these people are also quiet and shy. At a party, a wallflower can be found standing against the wall, watching the fun from a distance. They stay apart from other people, waiting for someone to talk to them or ask them to dance. And that's the end of this Words and Their Stories. Practice using these two expressions, shrinking violet or wallflower. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. A business in southwest England is using an electric fence to enforce social distancing rules to stop the spread of COVID-19. Johnny McFadden is the landlord of Star Inn, a public house or pub in the village of St. Just. He set up the fence in front of the pub's main drinking area to make sure that people keep at least two meters distance away from others. McFadden said, If I had put a little bit of rope there, I don't think anybody would have taken this much attention as they have to an electric fence. He spoke to the Reuters news agency. England is famous for its pubs where locals gather to enjoy alcoholic drinks and sometimes food. The government gave pubs permission to reopen on July 4th, but they must enforce social distancing measures. That includes limiting pub employees' contact with customers and reducing the time customers spend at the bar. McFadden said the rules represented a big culture change for his business. I run a very small bar. Everybody is accustomed to sitting at the bar, pushing at the bar. They can't do that now. Things have changed, he said. The fence is not actually turned on. But McFadden said, that the same logic which works in the nearby farms of rural Cornwall also works for the local drinkers. He said, as long as there's a warning sign on an electric fence and you are warned about it, it's totally legal. And there's the fear factor. It works. McFadden added, people are like sheep. Sheep keep away, people keep away. I'm Jonathan Evans. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about William McKinley. He took office in 1897 and was re-elected in 1900. He led the United States into the 20th century. One way to think of McKinley is as a transition president. In the 1800s, lawmakers were mostly concerned with how the country was growing in North America. But during McKinley's government, the U.S. looked beyond its borders. Congress declared war on Spain the first time the U.S. had fought a European power since the War of 1812 against Britain. The U.S. also took control of overseas territories, annexed Hawaii, and tried to regulate the world's trade with China. Some historians say President McKinley himself wanted the U.S. to increase its international influence. Others argue that he was just answering the country's mood at the time. Either way, his presidency is often defined by the country's rise as an imperial power.
McKinley was the sixth president to come from the state of Ohio. He was the seventh of eight children. Historians describe his childhood as loving and fun. His father owned a small iron factory. His mother raised her children to be honest and polite. McKinley was a hard-working student. He briefly attended Allegheny College in Pennsylvania, but he did not have the money to finish his education there. A few years after leaving that school, he volunteered for the Army on the side of the Union in the Civil War. He served under a man who would later become president himself, Rutherford B. Hayes. The two stayed close throughout their lives. After the war ended, McKinley studied law, became involved in Republican Party politics, married, and had two daughters. His wife, Ida, was an energetic, well-educated young woman from a wealthy family. For a while, she had worked in her father's bank. But Ida McKinley's health began to suffer. She was struck by seizures. Then her mother died. A few months later, her younger daughter died while still an infant. Ida McKinley clung to her older daughter, but the little girl soon developed a fever disease, and she died too. William and Ida McKinley were never the same. Ida McKinley remained sick her entire life. She spent most of her hours in a small rocking chair sewing. William McKinley paid great attention to her. He organized his schedule to spend time near her, even as his political success grew. In time, McKinley served in Congress and as the governor of Ohio. He was known as a likable person and a skilled politician. His Republican Party nominated him on the first ballot at their convention. A few months later, Voters elected McKinley into office in a landslide. He became the country's 25th president. When McKinley took office, the U.S. was just coming out of a severe economic depression. His government quickly approved a high protective tariff to help struggling workers. In general, his administration also permitted the growth of big business. But most of McKinley's attention as president was devoted to foreign policy. The main issue was Cuba. At that time, Spain controlled the island. Cubans revolted, and Spanish forces used violence and detainments to crush the rebellion. In the U.S., many Americans denounced the events in Cuba. They wanted McKinley and his government to intervene. At first, President McKinley was unwilling. He tried to use diplomacy. He even ordered a U.S. ship into Spanish waters near Havana to show his continued support of Spain. But the ship, called the Maine, exploded. Americans believed the Spanish were responsible. Relations between the two countries worsened fast. Spain declared war. The U.S. Congress answered in kind. For 100 days, U.S. and Spanish forces fought in Cuba and other areas under Spanish control. The war quickly turned in the Americans' favor. When the Spanish-American War ended with the Treaty of Paris in 1898, the U.S. took control of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines from Spain. Cuba was made independent. However, the U.S. continued to occupy the island for several more years. Not everyone approved of the actions of McKinley's government. 
Even some members of Congress warned against the U.S. becoming an imperial power. But a majority of voters approved of McKinley as a victorious commander-in-chief. They also noted that the U.S. economy was getting stronger. In 1900, McKinley won re-election. As it turned out, McKinley's second term in office was short. In September, only six months after his swearing-in, the president was receiving visitors at a fair in the city of Buffalo, New York. One of the visitors in line was a 28-year-old man named Leon Szolgosz. His family was from Poland, but he lived in the city of Detroit, Michigan. He had worked in a factory, but at the time was unemployed. He supported the idea of anarchy, no government at all. When McKinley reached to shake the young man's hand, Shulgosh shot the president twice in the stomach. Although injured, McKinley spoke to his guards. He told them not to hurt the shooter, and he expressed concern about how his wife would feel when she learned he had been shot. Quickly, McKinley was taken to a hospital. Doctors predicted that he would survive. And for a few days, McKinley seemed to improve. But the wound became infected, and eight days after the attack, McKinley died. The president's murderer did not say he was sorry for his act. He defended it, saying McKinley was an enemy of working people. Within a few weeks of the shooting, Shulgosh was tried, found guilty, and executed. Both the nation and the world mourned when McKinley died. He had been one of the country's most popular presidents in many years. He left behind the beginning of what some called an American empire. He also marked a change in the U.S. presidency. When he first took office in the 19th century, most presidents acted primarily as administrators. But President McKinley began to act in ways that are more like a modern president. He prepared remarks to give to the media. He traveled across the country speaking to voters. He used the power of his office to direct the armed forces. McKinley laid the groundwork, but he did not completely change the presidency. He left that to the even more famous man who followed him into the White House. After McKinley's death, his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, took office and truly brought the country into modern times. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Pete Musto. And I'm Dorothy Gundy.